In today's episode, I wanted to speak to those of you who are professional procrastinators, right? Really a thing that you always have to master your entire life. I don't know that anyone is like, oh, I'm completely eliminated procrastination. It's not because you're lazy. That's really important. It's not because you're lazy. It's not because you're a bad person. Do you want to know why you procrastinate? Hey, hey, Courtney Sanders here. If you're new to me, welcome back to my podcast. Yes, if you're listening to this on iTunes or Spotify, you can also come on over to YouTube to see me live in the flesh. Well, not live, but you can see video footage of this podcast. And if you're on YouTube, you can always subscribe to iTunes or Spotify so you can listen to me on the go. But either way, don't delay in listening to this podcast because it's about one of your favorite subjects or one of the favorite subjects of my audience, which is procrastination. I don't know why it is that when I do this topic, I just get a lot of people <laughs> who are very interested in it. I guess I shouldn't be any surprise because procrastination is something that I had to overcome big time early on in my career. And truth be told, it's, it's really a thing that you always have to master your entire life. I don't know that anyone is like, oh, I'm completely eliminated procrastination. I mean, you do, you get tools, and then as you get to the next level in your life or your situations change, you need new tools to make sure that that procrastination doesn't crop back up. So. In today's episode, I wanted to speak to those of you who are professional procrastinators, right? Because I understand and I had been there. Yes, that's a clap. <laughs> I had been there, right? I know what it feels like to be a professional procrastinator, but I also know what it feels like to have pushed past and to overcome that. And so I know there's a lot of, you know, how to get over procrastination content online, books, etc. I know because I read them all in my early days, especially in my early 20s when I was struggling trying to start this business and, um, you know, finish my college degree. Some of you guys know my story. I had a full ride engineering scholarship scholarship and I lost it trying to start a business. I was skipping class. Engineering is not one of those majors that you can skip classes. And so I really had to buckle down and learn early on personal development principles, but especially self-discipline and how to overcome procrastination. And in fact, that's what kicked me off into my life coaching career. And so I started blogging about those things and um, had people reaching out to me. I had a large uh, women's business organization invite me to bid on an RFP for some training and development for other college students, which really kind of turned me into this world of like, oh my goodness, people will pay you to help them with these skills. And so that's really how I got into life coaching. And incidentally enough, my first breakout hit program was called No Excuses Woman 21 Day Self-Discipline Challenge. So your girl's been around a while, right? Talk about this topic, talking about procrastination, but out of all the content that I see online, I don't find people talk about really um, the internal mindset and factors that contribute to procrastination, right? There's a lot of discussion around, um, I don't know, time block or use this type of planner or get up earlier in the morning or whatever to try to make you be more productive and more efficient with your time. But let's get to the root of why you're really not taking action, especially if you're a professional procrastinator. So if that's you, no shame, you're in luck because we're going to get into it right now. All right, are you ready for the secret to procrastination? I mean, literally, I'm gonna say this and then you can turn this off and go about your life. No, seriously, procrastination, first for the record, let me say, is not because you're lazy. That's really important. It's not because you're lazy. It's not because you're a bad person. It's not because you're not smart. It's not because you're not ambitious. It's not because any of those things. Do you want to know why you procrastinate, right? Drum roll, please. You procrastinate because it works. That's it. That's it. End of the podcast. Let me go ahead, turn these cameras up. No, <laughs> seriously, at the end of the day, you procrastinate because it works. And so if we're looking to eliminate procrastination, we have to replace it with a tool that works better for us. Right. But what do I mean by it works? Well, simply put, we procrastinate on tasks for which we associate pain. Yes, and it can be very, very small. I know a lot of people procrastinate on something as simple as paying bills or checking their bank account because there's pain associated perhaps with how they've spent their finances in the past month or how much money they do or don't have or whatever. There's some sort of like little niggling pain in the bottom of their stomach where they're like, oh, I really don't wanna deal with this. I don't wanna look at this. The reality of this situation causes me discomfort. It causes me shame. It causes me pain. Therefore, I don't wanna deal with it. 
So procrastination is almost like that release valve that gets you out of having to deal with the psychological drama or the psychological baggage of the task at hand. Now, also when I say pain, it could also mean the fear of failure, right? So it's not just pain around maybe something that we did and we don't wanna face that fact. It could be around the pain of failure. And even now, well over 10 years from when I started my coaching career and started in personal development, self-discipline and procrastination, I see why procrastination was such a struggle for me at that time in my life because I was dealing with a lot of fear of failure. I mean, I just lost my full ride engineering scholarship, right? I had a lot of pride in being able to achieve that. You know, my family was so proud of me. And then I went and tried to do this thing that I had no idea what I was doing, you know, had no idea how to start a business and, you know, completely failed, at least at that initial business. By the way, my first business was a hair care business, if you can believe it. And you should be able to believe it because if you check out my YouTube channel, I've actually left up some of those old hair care videos just so that you guys can see that I'm telling the truth about where I came from, right? So I'm not, I'm not new to this. I'm true to this. I started this channel a long, long time ago, but initially I'd started it as a hair care channel because I was trying to promote my fledging hair care business. And so not only did the business fail and I had dreams of, you know, becoming the next Mark Zuckerberg, which is so ridiculous, but at the time Mark Zuckerberg was in the news because Facebook um, had just gone public with its IPO and I was so inspired. You know, I was even thinking to myself, like, I don't know if I even need to finish school, right? Like, what if this business pops off and then I could just quit and go be a billionaire like Mark Zuckerberg? Ah, uh, <laughs> didn't quite work that way. But when the business failed and then my grades tanked and I got that letter in the mail that was like, um, at the end of this semester, your scholarship is gonna be revoked. Um, you need to figure this out. Like, how are you gonna pay for the dorms? How are you gonna, you know, pay for school and all of that? And I got into this place of really scrambling, just trying to make ends meet so that I could continue my education. I will say that there was a lot of pain associated with the fear of like, wow, what if I cannot turn this around? What if um, in addition to losing my scholarship, I completely flunk out of school and I'm not gonna be able to graduate at all, right? And then I'll have to go back home and I won't know what I'll tell my parents. Like, what if I'm gonna be a complete failure for the rest of my life? Now, again, now being 10, almost 15 years older, I know that sounds ridiculous uh, to think about, but back then those were, you know, real fears looming over me. And so a lot of the procrastination that I was struggling with was because I didn't wanna face the task that I knew would help me be successful, right? Going to class, getting my grades back up. Like initially I so struggled to do those things because it felt like everything around me was just like really, you know, crashing down and I just didn't know how to overcome it. And so that's how I dove into personal development head first. In fact, I don't even know how this happened. I know it was completely a miracle, but at school, even though my grades had tanked, I don't think that my GPA had like caught up with the official registration or something, but um, there were some administrators who were on the like student entrepreneurship board or committee, and they had thrown my name in the hat um, to be selected to go to a women's business conference. And so I got to go with about 20 or 30 other young women from all over the country to this conference, and they had a life coach on staff. And so this life coach really, um, you know, took us through personal development, how to do these different activities. And the one thing she had us do, which really just set all of this into motion, was she had us write a letter to ourselves about where we were going to be in 12 months. And I took this very seriously because she said that she was going to mail this letter to us in 12 months. And we would see if we were where we said in the letter that we wanted to be. And again, I was already dealing with so much shame and like pain and imposter syndrome, right? Because all these girls I got to go had good grades. And I was like, what if they, they don't know that my grades are like in the toilet? I don't even know how I got selected to be here. How should, you know, how can I be in this room? I don't really know. So I took that very seriously where I wanted to make sure that everything that I wrote down in that letter actually came true. And so I went head first. I mean, I would go to uh, Barnes and Nobles and sit on the floor for like three or four hours reading self-help books because I couldn't afford to buy them. I would check them out at the library. I was so serious and really got focused on building self-discipline and overcoming procrastination because I knew it was just like ruining everything, right? But uh, this kind of goes with why I say procrastination works and how you have to find tools that work better than what procrastination is currently doing for you, procrastination not only works because it eliminates this um, pain of the task at hand and whatever meaning you associate with it, right? So it could be pain of having to look at the past, some, some actions that you took and now you have to correct for it. And so you keep putting it off because you don't wanna face the fact of what you did, right? It could be the pain of the fear of failure of, oh, what if I put my all into this and it ends up not working out, right? That was definitely a fear of mine. You know, what if I put my all into, um, you know, really going back to school and really trying to succeed and graduate? What if I put my all into my second business, right? This was my second business after that hair care company. And this just proves that I'm not an entrepreneur and I'm really just a failure, right? 
there's those things. Also, there is the fear of success. So a lot of us, especially in the entrepreneurial space, don't get started because we're actually afraid to succeed because we associate pain with that. We might associate pain with um, leaving our friends and family behind. What will people think of me, right? I get this a lot for people who try to build online businesses and I tell them what a big advantage it is for you to show up and be visible online and to share your story. And people are reluctant because they're like, oh, I don't want to share my story. My high school friends follow me on Facebook. What if my mama sees it? <laughs> like, you know, everybody's really scared of like, oh, what, are, what about the people in my real life? What are they going to think if I just like go hard and start this business, right? What if I succeed and I'm extremely visible and the people in my life, you know, throw stones at me? What if I succeed and the people who aren't in my life, complete strangers, leave me nasty comments online? And then there's also the fear of success. That's also just the fear of delayed failure, which is what if I succeed? I'm on top of the world. Everybody's proud of me. And then I can't maintain this, right? That was also kind of woven into my fears um, back in school. So understand that procrastination is a release valve for that fear. So if you find yourself procrastinating on any task, you want to pause. And I do this like for everything. Pause and ask yourself, what is the pain that I'm associating with this, right? I've done this if there's, um, you know, an email that I keep, you know, dragging and I haven't sent it. And it's like, hanging out on my to-do list and my team is like, Hey, like, you know, this person is keeps reaching out. Like, have you followed up with them? I have to sit with myself and say, what pain am I associating with this task that I am essentially alleviating? Because remember procrastination works by procrastination, right? But procrastination also works because it forces us to get the task done, which I know sounds crazy, right? Procrastination is like not doing things and not getting the work done. But if you procrastinate long enough, you'll put yourself in a situation where you light a fire under yourself and you have no choice but to get it done. So for a lot of people, this is the cycle that they're in where they have all of this like emotional baggage around the task at hand. So they put it off because it alleviates that mental pain, but then they put it off so long that this deadline becomes looming. And sooner or later, the idea of not completing the task at all becomes more painful than the idea of actually doing the task. And then they get it done, right? Suddenly they're able to lock in and they're focused and it's the night before it's the deadlines coming up, you know, they're working furiously and then voila, they turn it in. And yes, it's a relief of like, whew, I made it, I got that done, but it's also this feeling of like, mm, I got in by the skin of my teeth. It's also this feeling of like, wow, that wasn't my best work because I didn't give myself adequate time. So this is why I say we have to remember that procrastination works, but it's not the most effective tool for us, right? So again, if you're a professional procrastinator, you have become a professional and putting off the pain of task, right? Through procrastination. And then also forcing yourself to do tasks through procrastination. That's why you're a professional procrastinator. So if you want to be a professional producer, right? You want to be productive and not have these issues. What are some things that you can do to overcome procrastination? Well, very simply, we have to create an environment where, you know, the stress and this pain around the task and also this need for urgency and this looming deadline is not necessary in order for us to get the task done. So let's talk about some ways we can make that happen. All right. So the first thing you have to do if you are a chronic procrastinator is you have to um, lower the stakes, right? You have to not wrap your self-worth up in these tasks or whatever pain you're associating with that. You have to force yourself, like literally choose to not associate pain with that task. And I know it can be very difficult because we extrapolate all these like horrible things that we think are going to happen if we don't get this done, right? If I don't turn this in, my boss is going to fire me. I'm already on a PIP, right? A performance improvement plan. Um, I'm not going to be able to feed my family. Um, if I don't do this, I'm going to get kicked off the committee. If I don't um, uh, turn this in, this uh, whatever, if I don't send this invoice, this client is going to go find someone else, right? Like we know the reasons why we need to do this, yet why are we not doing it? Like this is a big account. The client just asked me for some very simple things. Why am I not doing it? Again, because there's pain associated there. There's pain because perhaps you're associating that, you know, if this doesn't work out with this client or maybe the client pays you and then you're not able to do a good job, that it'll be like this horrible thing and, you know, your reputation will be ruined and they'll ask for a refund. And so in a way you're avoiding that future pain that you are like forecasting by procrastinating. And so the first step is to not make these things so big in the first place. I call this mind reading, right? All of this mind reading that we do of like, what someone else thinks or what we think is going to happen. Maybe fortune telling is a better word for this. All of this mind reading fortune telling that we do around all these horrible, you know, negative things really, I think is uh, catastrophizing, right? We think everything is going to be a catastrophe 
we have to learn how to rein that in. And so really at the end of the day, this, this boils down to a feeling of safety within yourself and a feeling of safety that no matter what happens, you are going to be okay. And I know that's easy to say, and it's hard to like really dive into this on, you know, a podcast or a YouTube channel, right? Which is why I recommend that you join my coaching programs and, you know, get involved with someone who can really kind of unpack these things for you. But ultimately it boils down to self-worth, right? Thinking that regardless of what happens, we are worthy of good things, right? We are worthy of taking action. We're worthy even if we make mistakes or even if things don't happen to us, but ultimately that there is safety and that our life isn't going to blow up. And that even if we make a mistake or we turn in the thing and it's not good enough, or the client pays us and, you know, they get upset and they, you know, don't want to work with us anymore or whatever, that it's not the end of the world and that we're going to be okay. And so for me, just being honest, a big way that I do this, and I've done this increasingly, I think, especially once you become a parent and you have kids and you realize how much control over your life and over the world you actually don't have, my faith, right? My faith as a Christian, my faith prayer really, really helps me lessen the stakes and overcome my procrastination. Like I literally will recite scriptures to myself as I'm working on a task that I'm shaking in my boots on. Right. And I'm always challenging myself, always trying to do things that I've never done before, putting myself in positions where I'm like, this could either work out amazingly, or this could all fall apart. Like I literally find myself in a position like that pretty much every single month. And so just reminding myself, you know what, all things work together for the good of those that love the Lord or surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life or acknowledge the Lord in all your ways and he will make your path straight. Like I recite these things to myself. I pray about this stuff, every little thing where I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to be like, God, I need a sign. God, I need you to make the, make a way like Jesus, please open this door for me. I find myself constantly in prayer for this specific reason, because if it's dependent on me and me being completely perfect, then I am going to always make every task bigger than it needs to be. I'm always going to have a heightened sense of like, oh my goodness, if, if this doesn't work out, it's the end of the world. But there has to be that psychological you know, safety net. And for me, it's definitely my faith. Now, once you create that psychological safety net for you, again, however you do this, and for me, I do it through my faith, I like to break things down. I feel like a broken record. I talk constantly about breaking things down, but it's so important for this reason. Another reason you procrastinate is because the task feels big because it is big, because you've turned it into this huge thing. And you say, I'm not even going to start on this. I'm going to push this entire task off. I find that if you look at what it is that you need to do and you break it down into like the smallest, most micro steps possible, that naturally starts to lessen the stakes and naturally makes it less of this big thing because you're only focusing on this like very small thing that you need to do. Even in the example that I gave of like, oh my goodness, you know, sending an email um, that is causing me pain and stress and anxiety because I'm thinking like, what if I don't answer correctly or this person has a lot of power to, you know, support me in this thing that I'm trying to do. And what if I'm not able to give them what they want or whatever, even something as simple as like sending that email, I can break that down into micro steps. Maybe I need to, instead of just having on my to-do list, send this email. Maybe I would feel more confident in sending this email if I researched, you know, the person first, right? I'll often research people on LinkedIn or research the company or see what the goals are. Right. So I could feel more confident about the response ultimately that I sent. Maybe I'll feel more confident, especially if this is like, you know, a big email or maybe there's a proposal or something that I'm sending. If I have someone else look at it, right. Maybe I'll make the time for someone else to look at it on my team or a friend or colleague who's in the space who can really support me. So this is what I'm saying. Like we think these are very small things on our to-do list. Oh, it's easy. Just, um, you know, go to the bank and get the check. Just, send the email, just, um, write the article, just post the blog post, just, you know, shoot the YouTube video, right? Understand that if you are constantly putting it off, it's because there's some magnified pain or fear that you are associating with it. And so if you break it down into its smallest bits, you'll find that it's a lot easier to tackle. And as you do each of the small pieces leading up to it, it makes you more confident and alleviates that pain because actually you're prepared, right? Another thing you might feel kind of like, oh my goodness about is because maybe you're not fully prepared, right? So in that example, maybe I'm actually not prepared to send that email. Maybe it seems very simple, like, oh, just reply to this person. But in actuality, this is an important email. You know, I want to make sure that I clearly communicate whatever this pitch or whatever it is that I'm sending so that this person understands me. Maybe the first task isn't just to send the email. Maybe the first task is to um, spend 30 minutes and brainstorm all of my ideas. And then tomorrow spend another 30 minutes and 
organize it in a coherent narrative. And then the next day, call my friend who works in this industry and run this by her and see what she thinks. And then the next day, research the person on LinkedIn. And then finally the fifth day, right? If I've started this process on Monday, by Friday, now I'm prepared, I can send that email, right? But I would have broken a seemingly simple thing down to even smaller steps. And it really lowers the stakes and lessens that need for this to be you know, perfect or you think that the whole world is gonna end. Now, the next thing to do that could be very, very helpful is to create contingency plans. Now, I gotta be honest, I, I don't always do this now. I, I do feel like I've gotten to a place in a rhythm and again, just you know, my faith and stuff and trying things and it working out for me or me trying things and it not working out for me, but ultimately, you know, the end of the world not happening and me being able to kind of figure it out. Oftentimes now I try to focus my attention on plan A, right? And I trust that if plan A doesn't work out, I can then come up with a plan B and we could address it at that time. That said though, especially if you are new to this, if you're still building your faith, or you're still building um, this kind of internal self-worth that you are enough, even if things you know don't work out all of the time or whatever it is, learning how to lessen that pain, lessen that fear of failure, I definitely recommend contingency plans because again, it could help with that psychological safety that we're talking about. And don't get it twisted. There are still times where I will create <laughs> contingency plans, multiple contingency plans. In fact, I remember uh, being very stressed out at the beginning of our Croatia trip. So if you haven't checked out that video on my YouTube channel, you can check out that vlog slash video where I documented um, a group of entrepreneurs that I went on a yacht cruise in Croatia with over the summer. And it was amazing. And, you know, I learned so much and it was such an enriching experience, but it was also during the time when United Airlines was having its complete meltdown. And so I had actually flown Air France because I had stopped in Paris with some friends for a few days. And my husband who couldn't do the whole time because he had to work was going to come join us in Paris for a day and then we were all going to fly over to Croatia. So I was in Paris about two days ahead of him. So I was there, I had my luggage and everything was great, but the others were arriving. Their luggage was not arriving with them or their flights were extremely delayed. And then my husband was like literally caught in the middle of that whole United debacle and his flights kept getting canceled. He kept getting rerouted. He was in Houston and then DC and New Jersey. And I was like, oh my goodness, is he ever going to make it, you know, to uh, Paris? And it was getting to the point because we were in Paris for three days before Croatia. We were flying from Paris to Croatia in the boat right? The yacht was like taking off <laughs> at a certain time. And so I'm like, oh my goodness, what if he doesn't land in France in time? And then he misses the flight to go to Croatia. And then we set sail and my husband is not on the boat, right? Like this is not okay, right? Sound the alarms. This is like a really big deal. And so I kept trying to be calm, right? But I also, I'm not going to lie, found myself really starting to stress out. And so part of how I eliminated, or rather I'll say lessened <laughs> a lot of the anxiety around that was I created contingency plans literally on the fly. So while he was on the phone talking to United, you know, making things happen, I was making contingency plan B, contingency plan C, right? So contingency B, uh, plan B, I had bought an American Airlines ticket and I was like, I'm gonna have this on ice. I will, um, you know, cancel it if you end up not needing it. It's a refundable ticket. Yes, I know I'm gonna have to pay some extra fees for refunding the ticket, but I'd rather just have it like on deck in case United just completely says like, sorry, <laughs> we're not flying people anymore and you need to get on another airline in order to get over here. And then if that didn't work out, I was already mapping where um, the yacht cruise was gonna be stopping each day. And so if you missed the first day, I was like, okay, we're gonna be in this city in Croatia. It's this far from the airport. I've already looked up the Uber rates. You know, if you take this Uber, yes, it's a 45 minute drive, but you can meet us, you know, at the next uh, docking station that we're gonna be at. So I was already mapping that and I found that it really lessened the tension and the anxiety, you know, because I wanted to enjoy my time in Paris while I was waiting on my husband to arrive. And so I just share that as an example of feel free to create, you know, contingency plans if you're in a place where for whatever reason, this task that you're working on and there's plan A that you are building is just so magnified for you that you're like, oh my goodness, if this doesn't work out, I don't know what I'm gonna do. If that's where you are right now, that's totally fine. Think through ahead of time, okay, what would you do in plan B? What would you do in plan C? And also do some self-talk to yourself around why even plan B and plan C won't be the end of the world, right? I did the same thing. I was like, you know what? Plan B won't be the end of the world. He'll still get over here. No, he won't be able to experience Paris, but at least he'll make it in time for the flight to catch to Croatia. And then plan C, I was like, okay, if he misses that flight and he comes a day late after we've set sail, it's not a big deal. You know, it's not too far from the airport. I do have the map of where we're stopping. Like he has my GPS, he knows my location. Like I can make sure that he gets to where we are so that he can get on the boat 
and we could tell the crew and they could make special arrangements for somebody to come and get him. So again, not the end of the world. Most things in life, there's a way to figure it out. There's a way to kind of jerry rig stuff sometimes, even if it's not ideal situations. Again, we have to create these contingency plans for ourselves so that we have that psychological safety and we start to lower the stakes and lessen our need for procrastination. Now, the last thing that I think is important for overcoming procrastination that I actually don't hear talked a lot about, but I've noticed that as I've mastered this, or at least attempted to master this in my own life, that it has improved procrastination, productivity, but just my ability to get things done in general. And this is going to sound kind of strange, but bear with me. And that is actually increasing your pain tolerance. I know. What? Increasing your pain tolerance? Yeah, increasing your pain tolerance. Because remember, we started this whole procrastination discussion by highlighting the fact that procrastination works because it is a tool that you use to escape pain, right? It is a, an escape valve that you use to lessen the pressure that you are creating in your life. Yes, there are these different tools that we've talked about today that can help alleviate that so that you don't need procrastination as a tool. But I find that as you master your ability to deal with unknowns, right? To, um, to deal with uncertainty, to deal with the anxiety of like, oh my goodness, I don't know what's going to happen. And again, there's a variety of ways to do this. For me, that always boils back to my faith of like, okay, even if like the crap really hits the fan. I'm ultimately going to be okay. When you can start to sustain that and like hang in there while you're in it, you will find that you'll need procrastination less because as you come up on task, goals, assignments, whatever, that induce a level of pain in you, you don't have that reflex of like always needing to escape it or always needing to release the pain because you're used to caring a little bit. And I know that that's sensitive because so let me just <laughs> do a disclaimer i'm not talking about trauma right i'm not talking about abuse right if you're in an abusive relationship like i'm not talking about very severe things right where there's like a ton of pain that we're talking about but i'm talking about just our day-to-day -day inconveniences right maybe um you know your boss uh tells you hey at the end of the week i want to have a meeting and you're like oh freaking out like okay is this a good meeting is this a bad meeting and it's like oh i it's about that report so make sure that you have this report done by friday so that we can go over it in the meeting right and immediately you find yourself like hyperventilating because you're like oh my goodness i don't know if this is good or bad yes i can work on the report but what if it's not good enough for my boss what if this is going to be used against me and my performance reviews like we start doing the whole thing and then we start to put off <laughs> doing the report until thursday night Night, right and we're rushing it you know staying late at work just to get it done and now we're really stressed out because we're like oh my goodness this isn't my best work and now I'm presenting it to my boss a lot of this would have been alleviated from the very beginning if we learned how to have a bit of a, a higher threshold right for the pain of not knowing for oh I don't know if this is going to work out in my favor being able to hold that like not knowing this to sit kind of in the gap and be comfortable right and again, this all boils back to psychological safety, knowing that everything is going to work out okay, and knowing that as a person, your self-worth is still rock solid regardless of what happens. If you can start to build that up, you will find that you will need procrastination less. And now I know this is going to sound even more crazy, but I found what has really helped me is working out, particularly my Peloton. Okay. So I'm not saying you need to go out and run a Peloton. I'm a big Peloton fan. I talk about it all the time here on this podcast and on this channel. I am one of those Peloton moms, but whatever type of workout you do, even if it's just dance or maybe running, right? This is great for uh, marathon runners or whatever, <laughs> whatever sport you play or whatever physical activity you like to get in. I find that it's almost like a little laboratory for me to test my limits and to train my brain to hang in the uncomfortableness, right, of the set or whatever particular session that I'm doing until I make it to the end, right? So very often I will get on the bike, I will do these various rides. Typically I'll ride for 30 minutes at a time. And it's never like, oh, just get on the bike and you just ride for 30 minutes, right? They usually break it up where they're like, okay, we're gonna do a one minute push for this. And we're gonna do a two minute climb for that. And we're gonna do a 30 second sprint. And it's all these little blocks of intense effort on the bike punctuated by these pauses or these short periods of rest until the next block of work comes in. And so I found that instead of fretting about the ride, right? Logging into the bike, getting on the ride and being like, oh my goodness, why did I select this? It's 30 minutes, hit training, high intensity training. How am I gonna get to the end of this? Instead of thinking about the end, I find that if I can just focus on being okay with the pain in the minute, right? The pain in the pocket, right? Just, just this little 30 second push that we have or this little 45 second push. And I don't think about anything else. I just think about pushing 
And I think about the fact that, you know what, this pain that I'm feeling is actually a good thing because it means that I'm getting stronger. It means that my muscles are growing. It means that my discipline is coming up. Like if I can find reasons, right, Jedi mind trick myself into even almost enjoying this little painful pocket, as we say, when I get to the other side and I have a break, right? Oftentimes the next block of work, I'm able to push a little further. I'm able to have my you know, resistance up a little higher. I'm able to do more because I trained my capacity in the previous block. And so again, I know it sounds ridiculous, but you'll talk to any athlete, they'll say that the mindset that they develop you know, on the field or in their sport really does help them in their personal life. I found that even just training myself and something as simple as like learning, how to focus on the minute ride that I'm in, you know, before that break comes in really, really helps me when I have big projects or doing big, you know, uh, new initiatives in my business. And I'm tempted to procrastinate because it's kind of painful. This is a really big endeavor. It's going to cost me a lot of money. And I don't know if, you know, we're going to make the sales on the back end in order to pay for all of this, or I'm doing this big pitch to, you know, this big company or trying to work this thing out. I don't know if this is going to happen. Being able to stand in that uncomfortableness, right? In the pain of like the anxiety of, oh, I don't know what's going to happen. Being able to hold there until I get to the other side. Again, it's a threshold that you develop. And so whether you work out or not, you'll want to develop instances in your life where you de- deliberately put yourself in situations where you're a little bit uncomfortable and you're pushing yourself past your limits. And you'll find that as you do that, your limits will expand and you'll be able to handle more uncertainty, which then lessens the anxiety. And then again, lessens the need for procrastination. So I hope this was helpful for you. Again, these are really the things that I had to master in order to overcome procrastination. And these are the things that I'm reteaching myself all the time. You know, as you get to the next level, right, there's something else that comes up. And so I'm often having to, you know, reteach myself the principles that have worked in the past. But I hope this was helpful for you. If you have been procrastinating on starting your business, particularly on starting your coaching business, right, you've been looking at all these people launching their life and health and business and whatever coaching businesses online, you're like, oh my goodness, I want to do that. I wish I would have done that a few years ago. I'm looking to quit my job. I'm looking to increase my income. I'm looking to do all of these things. Let this video slash podcast be the wake up call you need to procrastinate no more. In fact, in my program, we do everything for you kind of rolled up in one, right? So not only do we help you get your coaching certification and it is an accredited coaching certification that you can get in 90 days. Yes. in just 90 days, but we show you how to come up with your own coaching methodology so that you will stand out from the crowd in the sea of other certified coaches. And we show you how to build a brand so that you can become the next big name in your industry. So if that is something that sounds interesting to you, go ahead and click the link below and you'll apply. And if accepted, you'll be invited to an enrollment call with my enrollment coordinators. But with that, thank you so much for listening slash watching, and I will see you in the next one. Bye.